Well, we'll get started. Um, I'm Mark Robinson, the Executive Director of the Compact of Cape Cod Conservation Trust. And joining me today is Vanessa Johnson from an exotic a locale up north somewhere. Can you wave? Hi, hi Vanessa. <laughs> and um, we're going to tag team this a little bit. I'm going to start off uh, with a little background. And then uh, Vanessa will walk us through um, the actual process of, of conservation restrictions. I noticed that in our workshop, some of our attendees are either uh, practicing attorneys or recovering attorneys. They know who they are. Um, neither Vanessa nor I are attorneys, but we are seasoned practitioners in the art of conservation restrictions. Um, and I'm very glad that you signed up to join us. <clears throat> I realize this is not a particularly um, glamorous topic in the field of land conservation, but I would argue that it's one of the most versatile and um, when you've been in the business as long as I have, you accumulate war stories. So here's one. Uh, I was 28 years old. I had just started working for the Compact and I was helping a number of the Lower Cape land trusts um, reach out to landowners and figure out ways to preserve their land. And up until that time, um, everything had just been donated. If occasionally somebody would help a land trust buy something, but most lands were coming in as pure donations. This was in the 1970s and 80s, early 80s. And I started on the job and I said, well, I, you know, I think maybe we should start broadening our toolbox and use these things called conservation restrictions, which I was becoming familiar with. And um, so I started talking to landowners. Well, lo and behold, there was a lower Cape attorney who is now deceased, um, who was doing an awful lot of pro bono work for the local land trusts. And he kept hearing from the land trust presidents that, yeah, this, this Robinson kid, he's going around uh, chatting up people about conservation restrictions. So he called me in for lunch and we went to the Lando, Land Ho in Orleans. And uh, he bought me lunch and he looked me in the eye and he said, what is it with all these conservation restrictions? Just get the GD land, will you? <laughs> it was... Um, I, you know, I was quivering a little bit in front of the uh, experienced attorney who um, has done so much work for so many land trusts. But um, I said, well, you know, there are some places where people just can't donate the fee simple title to the property. And they, um, they need to have uh, an alternative so that maybe they can keep it in the family, um, but extinguish the subdivision potential. And so it's, really based on that experience that I've had that uh, we've used this tool more and more um, as time has gone on. So um, I just want to put that by way of background. I'm not seeing our slideshow, Vanessa. I am what just happened? about to share it. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is a meat and potatoes subject. And I, I realize that uh, we don't have a lot of pretty pictures. The reason is that we Trying to drill through a lot of uh, material in a very short length of time. I'm not going to read this. I want you to understand that there is a starting point for conservation restrictions. It was based in the, the common law where people are, have the ability to restrict their property, typically for the benefit of an adjoining property. Conservation restrictions um, in Massachusetts state to 1969, where the legislature passed a, a statute, the Conservation Restriction Act, and it defined a conservation restriction. You'll see the definition here. That definition has been broadened to include other types of permanent restrictions, um, but that statutory restriction is a very important part of this process. It means that you can encumber a piece of land with a development restriction that lasts in perpetuity because it has the approval of both the town and the state in Massachusetts through the town selectmen, the city council, um, but also the secretary of energy and environmental affairs. And that's in a very important um, approval process that no other state has. Other states use something called the Uniform Conservation Easement Act or, re, or versions of it, which was incorporated um, by a number of attorneys nationwide in 1981, amended various times, most recently, I think in 2007, and so those are, um, it's, a, it's a model uh, piece of legislation that, that uh, different states can use, but nobody has this kind of local and state approval that Massachusetts has. Most groups call, most states call it a conservation easement. Uh, 
Massachusetts has to be different, we call it a conservation restriction. But the intent is the same, to bind a piece of land in perpetuity and have some benefit of the, uh, of the, of the law behind it uh, so that you can make the restriction run with the land down through time. Next. Sorry, give me a second. <laughs> there we go. So as I mentioned before, um, although it's much cleaner and neater and easier to do a two person transaction between the land trust and the landowner to get the title to it, to a piece of property, um, in some cases that just won't work. And if you wanna preserve a piece of land, this is a very flexible tool to use in many different situations. Um, it's not a common law deed restriction. A common law deed restriction would be something like, I sell you the lot next to my house um, but I put restrictions on it that you can't have a pool or a tennis court. That would be a common law or deed restriction between uh, two adjoining landowners. And it would only run in Massachusetts for 30 years unless I re-recorded it. Um, it's not being done in the public interest. It's just to serve a private purpose. But a conservation restriction is in the public interest. Um, in gross means that you do not have to own adjoining land to have the benefit of a conservation restriction. That's why a land trust uh, can hold restrictions on private properties or town properties where they don't own adjoining land or pertinent land. And we can use this tool also to bind not only private property, but public land. Um, and you'll see as we go on that a number of the new state programs such as the Conservation Land Tax Credit Program requires uh, an outside entity to hold a conservation restriction as an overlay protection for the, uh, for the property being purchased for conservation. Although the state statute does allow for temporary conservation restrictions, we don't see many of those nowadays. Uh, typically, if people are only interested in a period of years, they might enroll in the chapter 61 programs, uh, which is a lot more flexible in terms of being able to time it out uh, we also can use conservation restrictions to generate very important tax benefits, both federally through the state tax credit program and also property tax relief. Um, but sometimes that's not the most important thing. Sometimes it's being done for a, to secure a permit through a regulatory process or other reasons why there wouldn't be tax uh, benefits associated with it. And it's a tool that you can use in a number of different ways um, to protect various resources uh, so for instance, a scenic view could be um, just the view across a piece of land as opposed to actually um, preserving the land itself. It can also be used for historic properties to protect trails, uh, wetland buffers, vernal pools, uh, and, and also, as I said, to, uh, to fulfill requirements associated with a grant. Next. I'm gonna turn this over to um, to Vanessa now to guide us through the actual process itself. And I'll come back later and talk about uh, some of the impacts on taxes and um, enforcement and uh, some of the court cases that are seminal in this area. Vanessa? Great, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to run through um, what I think are the most important elements of a conservation restriction project. And I'll touch also on the actual drafting of the conservation restriction. Um, Mark, as you have more experience than I do, and I'll be expressing some of my personal opinions on how things should be done, or I should say my professional opinion on how I suggest things be done, I invite you to um, offer alternatives. Um, so jump in if you want. So the very foundation of your conservation restriction, of course, is your negotiations with the landowner. Our job as the land trust is primarily to listen. So over time, you learn what questions to ask to get a landowner talking. First and foremost, they usually love talking about their land and what they love about it. And what you want to try to understand is what are their goals and what are their motivations. Um, so in terms of goals, do they have trails? Do they want trails? Do they want public access? Do they never want public access? Do they want to save wildlife? Do they want to farm? Are they farming now? Um, are they homesteaders? Um, do they just love the birds and the deer in their backyard? And that's only a small small fraction of the, the landowner goals that you want to seek to understand. 
What are their motivations? Do they simply hate development and never want to see it on their land? Do they love wildlife? Are they looking to reduce their taxes? Are they looking for an income tax deduction? Are they looking for income, period? Is this part of their estate plan? And more. So every communication that you have with a landowner is part of your negotiation and ultimately it informs the conservation restriction that you'll be drafting. I strongly encourage you to take notes um, to track your discussions. You'll be very grateful um, as you work on more and more projects and your brain gets more and more crowded with details. You'll be very grateful to have those notes to refer to um, as you move forward with working with um, this landowner. Due diligence. How do you know you're paying the right amount for a, land, for a conservation restriction if you're paying for it? How do you know that the person you're talking with is actually the landowner or is the decision maker um, and able to make decisions about the land or is the only decision maker? Here's where due diligence comes in. I'll touch briefly on the appraisal. Do you as a land trust always need an appraisal? Not necessarily. If your CR is being donated it is the, and the landowner is looking for an income tax deduction for that donation, it is the landowner's responsibility to obtain that appraisal. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. However, if the land trust or a municipality is acquiring land, um, if the land trust is partnering with the municipality or obtaining state funding to acquire a conservation restriction, you will need an appraisal. Um, typically that appraisal, definitely for state grants, needs to be to EEA specifications. So um, uh, raise your hand if you're not familiar with the alphabet soup of acronyms here. I use EEA as shorthand for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. That's the overarching agency that oversees Fish and Game, DCR, Division of Conservation Services, MDAR, all the other state agencies. Um, and the state grant program. So they have their own set of specifications for appraisals that largely overlap with IRS specifications, but not completely. So you wanna make sure that any appraisal you obtain to satisfy public funding purposes meets EEA specifications. The title exam, also critical. At my organization, we had a title exam for every conservation restriction we work on. Even if it's a pure donation, it doesn't make a difference. It's the only way to reveal all of the hidden pitfalls <laughs> of owning an interest in land. Um, if there's a mortgage on the property, yes, you can do some of this research yourself at the Registry of Deeds, but believe me, it's hard to uncover everything. So if there's a mortgage on the property, that mortgage will need to be subordinated to the conservation restriction. Otherwise, it can actually, if the bank ever foreclosed on that mortgage, the conservation restriction could go away. So the only way to make sure that conservation restriction is permanent is to get that mortgage subordination. Are there right-of-ways on the property? Is there an outstanding order of conditions? Are there any other liens on the property? Has the landowner paid their property taxes? Um, are you even dealing with the landowner? If it's a trust um, that, that owns the property, you wanna make sure you, want, you know who all the trustees are and who has the authority to sign on the behalf of the trust, same with an LLC. Are there any, if this was a piece of property that was inherited over time, there might be distant cousins that are still on title. So the, all of that needs to be taken care of early in the process. You wanna do your title exam early in the process so you have plenty of time to work with the landowner to remedy these title defects before you go to record the conservation restriction. So I'm only going to touch on funding um, and, and only in the context of how that impacts your, your conservation restriction drafting. Typically, the CR itself has to reference any public funding that you're getting and possibly even federal funding. I'm not as experienced with federal grants, but um, the ones I have worked on, you do have to acknowledge those in the CR and sometimes they have specific language they want you to include. Um, if you are a town or if you are working with a town with CPA funds or any other town funding, you need to include a certified copy of that town meeting vote as an exhibit to the conservation restriction. So that shows the authority of the town um, to acquire an interest in land. Um, what do your funders care about? 
If you applied for a state grant, typically those state grants require public access. So you wanna make sure your conservation restriction allows or grants public access. Um, if you applied for a drinking water supply grant through the state, you wanna make sure your conservation restriction is protecting that drinking water supply. Um, typically these agencies have a, have a, um, a role in reviewing the CR, so they'll, they'll catch you if you haven't, but these are things that you want front, um, front and center in your mind as you're negotiating and drafting the conservation um, restriction. CR approval, as Mark said, um, Massachusetts is the only state in the country, as far as I know, that requires both municipal and state approval of conservation restrictions. Even if the municipality is not a party to that restriction, they still have to sign that, it, that conservation restriction as a sign of approval and acknowledgement that it is in their municipality. In Massachusetts, your main point of contact with the state is going to be um, our CR reviewer, John Joya. Um, he is outstanding to work with, he is experienced, and he is on top of what's happening nationwide with conservation restriction language. He works for the Division of Conservation Services at EEA. He is the, once you've drafted the CR and negotiated it with the landowner, John is the person you work with to get it reviewed by the state. And you cannot proceed with signatures until you have a letter from John that gives you the authority to proceed with signatures. So that is your first step. Then you can, once you have that letter in your hands, you can proceed with getting the land trust and the landowner and town signatures. In the town, typically it's the selectmen or if it's a city, it's the mayor and city council that have to sign that conservation restriction. If the town is a co-holder or a holder of the conservation restriction um, under the care, custody and control of the CONSCOM typically, then the conservation commission also needs to sign that conservation restriction. Some towns like the Conservation Commission to review and approve the, the CR, even if they're not signing the CR. Um, so that depends on the town you're working with. That is not an EEA requirement, but typically before I go to the Board of Selectmen, I'll bring the CR to the CONSCOM and ask them to make a vote of recommendation that it be signed by the Selectmen. But again, that depends on the town you're working with. And then the Secretary of EEA, Right now it's Kathleen Theo Herides. The secretary of EEA signs last. She will not sign unless you've received all the other signatures. And John Joya has been great in um, facilitating the, all of that electronically. So, but again, he's he and Denise Perez, who is his outstanding assistant who works in his office are the primary folks you'll be working with on that. Baseline documentation report and monitoring. These are worthy of an entire day <laughs> workshop. So I'm not going to go into detail on these. I strongly encourage you to take advantage of the annual Mass Land Trust Conference of LTA's um, annual rally and also LTA webinars and any other training you can get on how to do baseline documentation reports and, and the protocols for monitoring. LTA's standard and practices is also a good place to, to go for that. Very briefly, the baseline documentation report documents the state of the property in both photographs and narrative at the time that the conservation restriction goes in place. The baseline report is in particular documenting those conservation values that you're protecting in the, the conservation restriction. Monitoring is the land trusts or the, the CR holders, I should say, I'm assuming everyone on this call is with a land trust and that's not a good assumption. Monitoring is the CR holders obligation in holding that CR. If you hold a CR, it is your obligation to enforce that CR forever. So typically that means annual monitoring. Some land trusts, including mine, monitor some properties every other year if that's appropriate. Um, I think LTA standards and practices recommends every year. Um, but both the baseline documentation report and monitoring are the res typically the responsibility of the holder of that conservation restriction. Federal income tax deduction documentation. I mentioned earlier that if a landowner is donating or a conservation restriction or doing a bargain sale of a conservation restriction, 
that they are responsible for obtaining the appraisal that they submit to the IRS to document that um, charitable contribution. The land trust's role or the CR holder's role, if it's, a means, if it's another entity, is to hit the IRS over the head with what the conservation values are that you're preserving. You do not want to make them guess. How do you do this? One is the baseline documentation report. It is strongly suggested that landowners submit a copy of the baseline documentation report to the IRS. This is not required by the IRS, but again, the landowner it wants to be hitting the IRS over the head with the conservation purposes that they are protecting through the CR and that renders them eligible for this income tax deduction. So we always give landowners two copies of the baseline report for this reason. Supplemental statement. This is, um, a, it can be as many pages as you like. It's, it's reiterating the conservation values that the CR is protecting. Yes, I know that this is generally in the baseline report and it is in the conservation restriction. But again, you wanna be hitting the IRS over the head with these conservation values. So that's, that's the intent of the supplemental statement. It's saying here are the public benefits and the conservation values that are being protected by this conservation restriction. The acknowledgement letter. This is basically the letter you get from any organization when you make a donation to them, whether it's a car, cash, or a conservation restriction. So this is a letter that comes from the, the, the conservation restriction holder that attests to your receipt of the interest in land um, and attests that the landowner did not get any uh, um, private benefit in exchange for that. And finally, the landowner has to fill out or the landowner and their tax advisor has to fill out, fill out what's called IRS form 8283. And you can look that up on the IRS's website. But the land trust or the, the CR holder has to sign that 8283. And LTA strongly recommends, and I echo that, that you look at and you, you ask for and review the landowner's appraisal before you sign that 8283 form. You wanna make sure that the value that the landowner is claiming for their deduction, for the donation or bargain sale of their land or of their, or of their conservation restriction is something that you as the land trust can stand behind. Because if the IRS audits that landowner and claims that that landowner um, is not eligible, the land trust typically is also brought into that case. That has never happened to my organization or any organization I've ever worked with, but the point is you don't want it to happen. So you wanna make sure that when you're signing that federal form, you can stand behind the numbers that the landowner is claiming. CR drafting. Again, that's a whole day in and of itself. So bear with me while I run through what I think are the most important elements. I think we're very lucky to be in a state that has an outstanding conservation restriction model to start with. So you do not have to start from scratch. In fact, you won't be allowed to start from scratch. Um, you are required to use this model, which you can download from the state's um, conservation restriction review program website. It is in the process of being updated, but for the time being, um, this is the model that you are to use. Um, this website also has a link to um, not only to download the CR, but to download the CR application form that you have to submit. When you submit that CR to John Joya and Denise for review, you have to submit the application along with it. Here's where you download that. This website also has additional resources, a link to um, the state's online GIS data viewer, which is a great resource for finding out what conservation values are on land that you're preserving an outline of the CR review process and some other resources as well. This is a look at the first page of the conservation restriction. Here's where your title exam comes in. Who is granting the CR? This is the legal entity that has authority to grant the conservation restriction. Who is receiving the CR? Who is holding it? and all of the entities, whether it's a land trust, a land trust and a municipality, I'm working on one right now where it's DCR and two municipalities that are going to, is that a try hold of a conservation restriction? So this is where that is all defined. Um, where is the conservation restriction? This isn't just an address. You have to have a legal description of the area under that CR. 
Um, that is in the form of either a narrative meets and bounds description that can be followed on the ground. You might need to survey. Um, typically, if the conservation restriction is not following um, the description of the entire legal description of the parcel, we have to get a survey done to have a new description written up of just the area that CR covers. So this is where all of that is referenced. And your title exam comes in because if your property is being described in terms that you can't actually follow on the ground, you may need a survey. If the title company isn't willing to insure your property, your conservation restriction, based on the description in the title report, you'll want to get a survey to get a legal description of that property. Then we get to the purposes section. This is where you define the conservation values that the conservation restriction is protecting. And this is where if your landowner is claiming a charitable income tax deduction for IRS purposes, you want to be crystal clear that the conservation purposes that, that your, your conservation restriction passes the conservation purposes test. So you want to be very clear that um, what the conservation values are on the property you're preserving and um, and to the extent possible mirror the language that's in the IRS regulations if it's a tax deductible CR. If there is any public funding, typically that goes in this section as well, some reference to that public funding. Um, in the future, if there are ever any questions about what is allowed in the conservation restriction, the purposes helps to guide um, guide future conservation restriction monitors through that ambiguity. So the purposes are also really important for saying, at the end of the day, here's what needs to be preserved on this property. And the model, the CR model um, from the state has a very comprehensive list of all of the different conservation values you want to consider might be on your land, along with links to state reports, to biomap, to um, Mass Oliver, so you can see what's what's uh, considered um, priority habitat, for example, um, whether it's got NRCS prime farm soils, whether it's got drinking water, um, uh, whether it's got uh, um, resilient landscape on it, which is increasingly becoming something that funders are looking for, is protecting land that confers climate resilience, which I tend to think is virtually any property that meets any of the other conservation purposes. Um, whether it's scenic and whether there's public access, that's also um, something you'll want to note in the purposes section. And I want to emphasize that your conservation purposes must be specific to the site you're talking about. So don't say that the premises is protecting a stream. You want to say that the conservation restrictions are, re are protecting the Parker River and the Parker River has been designated a scenic river by X agency. So you want to be as specific as possible to the property that you're preserving. If it's in an area of critical environmental concern, you want to mention that. So you want to be specific to the site, you want to be as descriptive as possible, you want to cite reports, um, studies, designations, and do not worry about repetition. Obviously, if you're protecting drinking water, you're probably protecting habitat. If you're protecting priority habitat, you're probably protecting biomap to core habitat. It doesn't matter. Repeat, repeat, repeat. The overlap is good. Remember, you want to hit the IRS over the head with what the conservation purposes are. And um, by the way, if you're also, if your landowner is also applying for a conservation land tax credit, you want to make these um, conservation values as clear as possible as well. So the next section, section two, is what I sort of consider the meat of a conservation restriction. It's called the prohibited acts and uses, the exceptions to the prohibited uses, and the permitted uses. So section A is the prohibited uses. You've probably heard of the bundle of sticks analogy when you acquire a piece of land. Owning land is like owning a bundle of sticks where each stick is a right for you to do something on your land. Section A of this section generally takes all those sticks and burns them, throws them all away. So you don't generally touch this section. This is what I call one of the boilerplate sections of the CA, CR that you generally do not edit because it's stripping away every right in that piece of land that the owner has. 
Section two, the reserved rights and exceptions is where all the exceptions to section A go. So in section A, you don't need to say, you know, you can't cut trees except to do vegetation management for habitat. All of that goes in section B. So here's where you're giving back some of those sticks to the landowner. Um, this is where you want to obviously remember the conservation purposes. Is there a stream running through the property? If so, you want to make sure that any permitted use protects that stream. So you might want to make sure that there are adequate buffers around that stream to protect that, the water quality from whatever permitted activity you're allowing. One way to do this, and we do this a lot in our conservation restrictions, is to rely on outside experts to set limits. We are not foresters. We are not um, farmers. We are, a lot of us aren't even ecologists, we're generalists. And so we rely on um, impartial experts to set the limits on the activities that can happen. If there's farming on the property, we generally require a farm plan. If there's forestry on the property, the state actually requires that the landowner get a DCR forest management or stewardship plan, or sorry, it's forest stewardship or cutting plan, I think is what they're called. Um, if there are trails on the property, you can reference the DCR trails guidebook. There's the Massachusetts Native Plant Society and, and um, organizations like that that keep lists of invasive species as well to reference. Um, if you want to limit chemical use on a farm, you could reference USDA organic, although that comes with a whole other um, list of questions. Um, so use these outside um, best management practices to limit what the reserved rights are. Um, so that you can be sure that whatever's happening on the property is still going to preserve the conservation values that you're trying to protect. Um, going back to your conversations with the landowner, you want to thoroughly understand how they're currently using the land. And that means year round. Um, if you're visiting a property in the middle of the summer, you might not know that in the winter they flood an area of it for a local um, a hockey pond, you see that a lot in, in my part of the world, or that maybe um, on the public trail, um, this probably doesn't apply as much to Cape Cod, but maybe there's a public trail on the property in the winter, snowmobilers use that. So one, do you want to continue allowing that? Two, if you decide snowmobile use doesn't impact the conservation values you're protecting, you want to make sure the CR allows that. So you want to thoroughly understand the current uses year round. We're actually working on a conservation restriction property right now where the landowner is a super, super science nerd. And he puts on this phenomenal laser light show for free every Christmas. So every December from Friday, Friday, Saturday and um, Friday and Saturday nights from dark until nine, he has this phenomenal laser show to music um, that is free. And so people just drive up the driveway, can tune into his radio station where he has the music and the laser light show cue to it. It has absolutely no impact on the conservation values at all. But for the first time ever, one of our reserved rights is for the landowner to continue doing a laser light show. So you never know, ask lots of questions. Ask about the intended future uses of the property. Um, not only with the current landowner, landowner um, but with future landowners, if they know who they're going to be, if it's going to be their kids, do they, do the kid, does the one of the children want to be able to build a house in case, in, that, in which case you'll want to leave out some land, ideally for that home, or maybe you want to leave that in the CR as a building envelope so you can limit the size of the house. And um, either way, you'll need to decide where that house is going to go. You want to anticipate future uses of future landowners. Are there new trails that will maybe need to be built? Or will those trails need to be relocated? Are there new structures that a landowner might want on the property? Um, will they want more run-in shelters, more fencing? Will they want to clear additional land for farmland or for a meadow for habitat? Um, will they want to expand existing structures? So you want to build in flexibility and adapt adaptability into the CR and give your stewardship department the ability to approve the unanticipated. So we actually have what we call a catch-all paragraph in our CR that allows us to approve additional unanticipated reserved rights provided, and we have sole um, ability to do this, exclusive ability to do this, provided we feel comfortable that these additional reserved rights are not going to impair the conservation value. 
So um, we feel that's very important to give that future flexibility. Clarity. You do not want to make future land trust or municipal staff, whoever's in charge of monitoring the CR, you do not want to make them guess what you meant. So be clear. Have other people read your draft conservation restriction. And I mean, ideally, your stewardship staff. So we, we have our stewardship staff read our conservation restrictions, because if they don't understand what I'm trying to say now, future stewardship staff are not going to understand what that conservation is supposed to mean, conservation um, restriction language is supposed to mean. I wouldn't necessarily rely on the landowner, although they obviously better be reading their CR too and trying to understand what it means because it's a legal document and landowners will sometimes just glaze over things or they'll trust us. Um, they won't be reading the CR at the level of detail you want someone to be reading it to make sure it's understandable. So I, I definitely recommend that you have um, someone else besides John Joya, although he's also gives excellent feedback on this, um, have some stewardship staff um, read your conservation restriction. So um, just want to leave you with a list of resources that have been very helpful for me. One of my Bibles on my shelf is a book called The Conservation Easement Handbook, which I think was last re revised in the early 2000s, but it doesn't matter. Whenever I encounter a new reserved right I've never um, encountered before, I go to this book to see if there are examples in this book um, that can help me phrase that. Obviously, with Google, you have access to other model, con excellent, I should have put them on here, um, but I'll make sure the compact has a list of those too. There are some excellent other model conservation restrictions out there. Pennsylvania has an excellent model conservation restriction. Um, Connecticut has an excellent model agricultural conservation restriction. So there are other, um, I think Michigan has an excellent model conservation restriction. So there are other sources you can go to for looking at language to address reserved rights that you've never um, encountered before and to help give you drafting ideas. Steve Small's Preserving Family Land series is also um, on my Bible, Land Trust Bible shelf. Um, his website, he also actually has some very useful case studies on his, on his um, website as well, but you can order those books through him or through LTA. They're very helpful in understanding how to draft a conservation restriction that will pass the IRS's conservation purposes test. Um, some additional websites, masswoods.org has some outstanding resources for uh, explaining conservation tools to landowners. I mentioned Oliver, that's the state's free uh, online data viewer with all of the state um, um, GIS information, again, for helping you understand the conservation values on a property. Land Trust Alliance has resources on their site. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the mass um, um, our, our own state's conservation restriction review program website is um, pretty essential and the Mass Land Trust Coalition also has um, great resources listed on their website. And so with that, I will uh, pass it back to Mark. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, can you give me an estimate from your initial meeting with a land, a private landowner to signing the form 8283 at the end of the process. Uh, what's, a, what's a standard length of time that you might work with that project? Um, I usually tell landowners six to eight months. That's, not, that's up to recording. The 8283 can be several months afterwards because they have up until when they file their taxes to do that. So typically that process, in my experience, happens several months after the CR has been recorded. But um, I tell people six to eight months, it can, be, it can be shorter if it's a pure donated CR. If there's any funding involved, we usually ask for a year to have the chance to raise that funding. I think that's key because, um, <laughs> you know, we can get a, a, a deed slapped together in a, in a day and have it recorded in a week, but these conservation restrictions, because of the, the level of complexity you know, instead of a two-page deed, it's a 20-page recitation. Um, the early conservation restrictions, they're still out there. I, <clears throat> I've seen some recorded from the early 1970s, and they literally are two pages long. Uh, they're still out there. They're still running with the land. They were 
you know, approved by the town and the state. Uh, but it's a very bare bones thing. It basically uses those prohibited uses. Um, and then there's not much else to it. So over the last uh, 50 years, all sorts of examples have come up with loopholes. And so those loopholes have had to be plugged. And that's why these restrictions now run to 20 pages. <laughs> Um, it's just an unavoidable uh, evolving complexity of life and, and the law. Um, so it's important to keep up on a lot of these, these things. I'm going to go over just briefly, um, and again, we could spend a whole webinar just on these, this one page here. But for the conservation restrictions that are involved with private, um, private properties, it's very important that you be able to either explain or have access to information to provide the landowner with these potential benefits. So uh, the conservation restriction, because it is typically, um, at least in our part of the world, extinguishing the right to put houses on land. And typically that is uh, the highest and best economic use of a property is to develop it residentially. Um, although I have seen an instance in the past year where the highest and best economic use was not to put houses on it, it was to put ground mounted solar arrays on the property. Mm. Um, but in any case, stripping those that right to economically develop the property can be considered a charitable act and will be recognized by the state, the feds, and the local assessors. And so that's really where these three benefits come, uh, come down. The, uh, the federal income tax deduction, it's been um, uh, part of the, the tax code for a long time. In 1986, uh, Boston attorney Stephen Small actually worked for the IRS and wrote the regulations, section 170H, that deals with the, uh, the treatment by the IRS for permanent conservation restrictions. And it's important that they be done in per perpetuity or there's no federal deduction. Um, Steve continues to serve as one of the top tax attorneys in the country, dealing with the niche of conservation easements and conservation restrictions. Um, and we're very lucky to have him as part of our uh, land trust community. But what happened in the past uh, five years is that uh, the Congress and the IRS has given very special favorable treatment to conservation restriction deductions to the point where they have allowed landowners to accelerate the deduction associated with this gift of value. Again, they're not giving away the land, but they're, they're extinguishing value in the property for the public good. To accelerate that by being able to reduce their adjusted gross income by up to 50% of the AGI each year. And they've extended the deduction. So instead of typically we have a six year period, a, the year of the gift plus a five year carry forward, uh, with a conservation restriction, the deduction can be spread out over the year of the deduction plus an additional 15 years, so 16 years. Um, farmers are entitled to reduce their adjusted gross income by 100% if they can show at least 40% of their income is from full time farming. So um, it's a very powerful tool. In fact, you could say, well, why do conservation restrictions get special treatment as opposed to a fee simple or outright title donation for conservation? And the reason has to do with politics, uh, that the, uh, the Western ranchers and the Texas cattlemen are, are very interested in, in having this, uh, this ability to extend the, the deduction way out into 16 years um, to capture all of the value in the land when they, they do this one-time conservation easement on their properties. Uh, estate tax relief is another part of the tax code where conservation restrictions can provide some bonus um, deductions. It's become less relevant. There's only 2% of people in the United States who pay estate tax. It is a very huge exclusion now for um, values of estate, so it doesn't come up very often anymore. Um, the syndication issue is something that's been going on primarily down south where investors buying properties will then typically get um, outrageously inflated appraisals and putting an easement on it and taking that deduction spread out upon the, uh, 
the members of the syndicate. Congress is trying to plug that, that hole and the Land Trust Alliance is key on trying to make sure that uh, the hard won conservation restriction deductions under the federal law are not perverted by this syndication issue. You can read about that in the Land Trust Alliance newsletters. It's, it doesn't affect us here as much in, in uh, New England because we're not seeing that phenomenon. And again, in Massachusetts, because we have uh, the conservation restrictions reviewed by the state, um, these inflated appraisals are not as, not as much an issue as they would be in other places. In 2009, the, the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the legislature approved something called the Conservation Land Tax Credit, a CLTC program. It's run by Tom Anderson out of the Division of Conservation Services in Boston, a state agency. And it enables people who donate or use a bargain sale, um, to put a conservation restriction on their property, private landowners, based on their own appraisal to receive a state refund check and or elimination of their state income tax for that year. It's a one-time thing. Um, a refund check of up to $75,000 or half of the appraised value, whichever is less. Um, my, my office at the Compact processes more of these CLTC projects than anybody, anyone else in the state. We've done almost 200 of them now in, in the past 20 years. Um, I'm sorry, in the past 12, 15 years. Um, and it's a very powerful add-on to the federal deduction for some people. And um, I can tell you that the ability to get an actual check back as opposed to a uh, reduction in the uh, adjusted gross income is a very powerful tool for some people. It also helps to pay with the project costs, which can be considerable. We didn't talk about that. An appraisal might cost anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 in our area for a conservation restriction mm -hmm. appraisal. <laughs> if there's surveying work that needs to be done, that's typically in the thousands of dollars. I've never seen a survey work done for less than $1,000 of any type. And uh, it can add up to $15,000 for a larger property here on the Cape. So those kind of costs can be offset with this refund check from the state. Uh, in the spring after the project is completed. So um, we've had tax credits uh, given to people who don't even live in Massachusetts. You don't need to be a taxpayer. You just need to own land that is eligible in Massachusetts to receive that. Um, I've gotten tax credits for people who live in Canada. So it's, um, it's a great tool that we never had before. And it's the first time ever that the state has been um, very generous to private property owners putting restrictions on their property. Finally, down at the town level, we have um, property tax relief for people who have extinguished uh, development rights in their property. So again, it, it's based on the, the fact that the assessors are supposed to look at what is the, 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 um, the fair market value of the property at any given point in time and base their tax bill on that evaluation. Well, we know that town assessed values are always three years out of date because they look back instead of at the present. And we also know that the, um, the way the computers run those programs, it can't be as fine tuned as an individual appraisal. But the, the core principle is that the assessors at the town hall are required to acknowledge any effect that a conservation restriction has on the marketability and the value of a property a private property. And this was codified in 1986 where the um, a local assessor and, uh, assessing issue in the town of Medfield went all the way up to the state Supreme Judicial Court. And that court uh, decided that yes, uh, assessors are required to, to take notice of any restriction on property that dampens the value of that property. And so the assessor has a lot of latitude to look at what effect in dampening the value is, but they cannot ignore the effect of the conservation restriction. So it's important for landowners and land trusts to send those restrictions in to the assessors. Um, they don't often always see them. If they're recording the registry of deeds, the assessors get copies of all the deeds that have been recorded every year. So they keep track of who owns what but they don't necessarily get the conservation restrictions sent to them 
by the uh, by the registry of deeds. So it's important for you to fill that link, I think. Now that's a lot of stuff in a very short time. Um, we're going to be starting to take questions, but are there any questions about tax tax benefits and in, in this regard? Send them in the chat. Okay, next slide. Sorry, working on it. I don't know why it's not going. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So um, we've had some very landmark cases in recent years. The Massachusetts Land Trust Coalition has provided amicus briefs in a number of these. Um, there was one in Wellesley last year that uh, made clear that holders of conservation restrictions can enforce uh, tree cutting by a third party on a conservation restriction. And um, so that was uh, the Wellesley case. I can send you the site on that. But the real seminal case here was back in 2006. And um, if, if you go to the next slide, Vanessa, there's a picture. So this, this very elaborate horse barn um, in the town of Weston in the, the swanky suburbs of Boston, uh, the landowner built this structure called it a horse barn within the conservation restriction area. And so the holder of the restriction, the Western Forest and Trail Association, which is a nonprofit, went to court and said, hey, this barn was not built within the building envelope. It was built in the restriction area. You got to move it. And it went all the way up to the uh, appeals court and the appeals court uh, decided in favor of the land trust. And here we have a photo of the barn being moved out of the restriction area and placed back into the restrict into the building envelope, um, showing just how how important this case was to send a signal that you cannot ignore these conservation restrictions. Um, and we actually had the uh, the attorney general, uh, who is defending the public interest in these conservation restrictions, um, also be involved in helping the land trust to assert its rights under the restriction. Next. And I guess that's it. Um, so there's a lot of topics here that we could spend all day on. We wanted to give you a brief overview of, of really the process, the benefits, uh, some of the angles involved with these conservation restrictions. Um, there's a whole lot more to learn. We have some terrific um, ability for people to tap into the experience that a lot of us have had with these things. I personally have probably looked at almost a thousand conservation restrictions in my time. I've written probably 800 of them. And um, so it's hard to find something new under the sun uh, with these things, but we're always evolving. Um, right now, the, there's a model conservation restriction working group, which is made up of state officials, um, uh, private attorneys, land trust folks, all working to massage the model conservation restriction to include some of the new emerging issues. And so it does, it does evolve over time. It's a, it's, a, it's a topic that you have to stay up on in the field. Um, but I really encourage some of the younger folks in this land trust community to, um, to get yourselves involved in this because it's a tool that has a lot of flexibility. We use it a lot of different ways and um, happy to provide advice for, for anybody that, that would like it. I guess I'm going to be reading the chat. Um, let's see. I'm just going to interrupt you and say we have some questions from. Oh, here. okay, Lily, would you like to drive that part for us? <laughs> yes, Carol, do you mind unmuting yourself and asking your questions of Vanessa and Mark, please? Okay, sure. Um, I was wondering, can you hear me first of all? Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, is the local property tax reduction only a one-year event after the CR is in place, or is this a permanent tax reduction for the yeah, property owner? It should be permanent. Again, the restriction runs with the land, uh, so it should be diminishing the value of that property every year that the assessors look at it. Okay. Uh, local assessors revalue properties every three years, um, but they're always making, making adjustments. And so you cannot assume that they will do it as a matter of course. You've got to bring it to their attention. And it's important to uh, examine your tax bill 
not just the tax bill, but there's information behind the tax bill, which is the property tax card. It's all public information. Um, you can get most of it online nowadays in most towns. Yeah. But um, no, it should be reducing the, uh, the value of the, of the extra land um, to a considerable degree if that land was considered buildable. Now, if you put a conservation restriction on wetland, it may not diminish it by much or anything. Um, so you do have to look at each individual situation, but the assessor um, should be alerted by the land trust or by the landowner that this restriction exists. And uh, one of the things that we have that is um, we're getting better at is mapping these conservation restrictions. So um, in the bad old days before the uh, geographic information systems on computer mapping, uh, we didn't have ability to capture these conservation restrictions in a good way. Um, the state is being much better at collecting that information and putting it on their state Oliver system. But a lot of the older conservation restrictions haven't caught up to that system. And it behooves land trusts in particular working in their community to make sure that those restrictions are mapped and brought to the, uh, the assessor's attention as well as to, you know, the planners and development uh, staff people in the town hall. So it's the job of the assessors to make sure it gets labeled as conservation restriction on Oliver? No, um, it's not anybody's job. There is a, there is a state um, mapping coordinator in Boston who is in charge of putting the new open, protected open space parcels on the state map. Um, but they're collecting information kind of based on the good graces of local officials and land trusts. So we need to do a better job making sure they have accurate information on those maps. When you record your conservation restriction, um, the state does, and uh, that's by state, I mean John Joya's office, when he, he does request that you send a shape file to his office for them to submit to um, MassGIS. So we, we do that. And then what happens once we send it to the state? is anyone's guess, but I think they've been, very, yeah. they've been very good about keeping that up to date. My problem right. is with the older ones. Yes. That they haven't really reached backwards in time as we move forward. So yes. um, that's the harder part. Yeah. And my other question was, when will the model CR um, be ready for viewing? Do you mean the new, the updated new model one. CR, yeah, the, the new, new one? one. Um, I, I think the, and, um, Originally, pre-pandemic, the goal was to release it at the annual Mass Land Trust Conference. Um, that process has obviously, obviously been a little bit slowed down by the pandemic, although not much. Um, John Joya and his wife also just had a baby, so um, his hours are reduced right now. Um, so I'm not quite sure on the timing, but we are still hoping that this spring it will be released. But it doesn't matter, use the current model, even if the new model comes out in the middle of your CR drafting process, um, you can still use the old model. There's nothing wrong with the old model. Um, so there's always kind of a, a, a lag between when the new model comes out and when you might actually be able to use it, but. Okay, thank you. Excellent, excellent information you've all presented today. We are thrilled. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? No more questions. So if anyone has questions, please enter them in the chat now. And Lily, will this, uh, you, I think you, you've said all along, this will, our recording will be available on the Compact website, is that right? Yes, so these, um, each session has been recorded and it will be made available via YouTube and then I believe it will be hosted on Mark's website, but we need to confirm that. And then do you want me to also send you my slideshow so that folks can download just the slideshow if they want? That would be amazing. Yeah, we'll Great. also be hosting it on the Barnstable Land Trust website on a single page. So we'll definitely put it there. Great, I will do that. Thanks, Vanessa. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And um, looks like the sun has come out, at least where I am. Uh, very much appreciated that you've uh, joined us on a Saturday morning. And hopefully next year, we'll be back at the Upper Cape Tech and have some uh, camaraderie for, for a change. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.